Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> might be a good segue into my uh, presentation here this afternoon. Um, the idea of communication, and maybe that's something that we're not doing well. My uh, area of expertise is in exercise psychology and sports psychology, and so hopefully I can sort of make that evident in terms of what that entails. Um, but there's a, we have got a catchphrase that's gained a lot of uh, popularity in exercise psychology recently, and that's mensana in corpore sano. It's that old Latin phrase that uh, has been translated to a sound mind in a sound body, and the idea that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to train one's mind if you're not uh, also interested in training that person's body. That idea certainly doesn't fit with the notion of declining levels of physical education across our country, as well as a lack of uh, participation in leisure time physical activity among, among uh, individuals of all ages. So, in terms of my background, I received my PhD uh, at Arizona State University, and then I went back home to where I uh, completed my bachelor's and master's the University of Wyoming, uh, and I was there for, uh, for four years at, uh, before taking this position. So I've got two real main interests, and these interests, uh, I often joke that they sort of cover the paradox that exercise makes us feel good, or, or so people say, but yet nobody participates in exercise. And so this first problem is a, is, is a really important one, and we'll talk about um, what's really helped the, bring attention to the idea of physical education in the public school systems, as well as adults' participation in, in leisure time exercise. But the idea that how do, we remain, how do we motivate other people to become and remain physically active, and where we're currently at in this in the area is that I, I don't believe we really know what factors we should ultimately be interested in, in terms of how do we, how do we get people to, to focus on that. And then my primary line of research might sort of be related to that other notion of the, the other side of the paradox, which is exercise makes one feel good. We have a lot of attention that's gone on looking at the effects of exercise on anxiety, depression, and then more recently for our aging population, the influence of exercise on cognition, cognitive function, and then uh, various insults like Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk about that and where we're at. But uh, what I do is I, I really, I'm interested in the role of the stress response. So here's uh, essentially how we've brought a great deal of attention to, to the role of exercise in, in our society and in most developed countries. As, we, as you see, we've got graphs of 1990 and 1999 and, and then 2008. As we move into the end of the 20th century and, the, and then into the 21st century, what you're seeing here is just increasing rates of obesity in each of those respective states. And then down below, you see there's a guide for the percentage of adults who would be classified as obese in the state. And so if we were to take 2008, obviously in the southeastern United States, it's not looking very good, uh, where you have uh, roughly uh, one-fourth or uh, e even more than a, th than a fourth of adults who are considered obese in those states. And then, you know, in the western states, you know, we've got a, I've sort of, I've got some friends there in Colorado, so sort of a shout out to Colorado because they're still at least not reaching obesity. There are a lot of factors that are related to this, but it has brought attention to the role of exercise, so it's helped us out. But then we got this notion, how do we get people to adhere to physical activity? Because even if there are all these purported health benefits, the, the main problem still stems from the fact that people are not adhering to physical activity or exercise. I guess the same might be said for uh, various medications that they might be on. For instance, like are individuals adhering to their blood pressure medications? The, the, the simple answer is no, they're not. Physical inactivity during leisure time is a burden on public health. There are some experts who are now arguing that it's the greatest threat on public health. And I like the idea, the notion that it's called behavioral cancer. What I have been focusing on in my lab uh, is the, we, we've been tracking youngsters' physical activity levels over about 10 years, and we're, so we're interested in their levels of physical activity, and then what are sources of influence on the kids' physical activity. And so thus far, we've, we've been focusing on parents' and peers' influence on physical activity. And what we found is that active parents may or may not have active kids, and the same can be said for inactive parents. It's a small yet significant relationship if we just think about role modeling of parents between uh, a parent's activity level and a child's activity level. But the relationship is much more complex, and so now we're getting in to tease out like what are specific uh, parenting behaviors that are going on. 
I like this notion, uh, this idea of, as I shift gears and talk about uh, uh, my primary line of research, the, the integration between the mind and the body. Re recall I said Mensana and Corpore Sano. Hippocrates, back in 400 BC, was adhering to that notion. He, Hippocrates had, he has written about some people who went, it, went to see him, and he, was, he had diagnosed them as having poor mental hygiene. And you might think, well, what would we diagnose them today if they were diagnosed back then with poor mental hygiene? He actually prescribed exercise. Now, I'm going to sort of underscore or underline that notion. He prescribed it. He didn't recommend exercise. He prescribed it. Henry Thoreau, one of our greatest thinkers, said, I think I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least, and as it is commonly more than that, sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields absolutely free from all worldly engagements. I'm going to put that on my office door. From students from 12 to 4, I'm, I'll be out sauntering. You can't reach me. Uh, see how well that goes over. Uh, there, we, we do have a, a new a notion that's, that's coming around, and American Medical Association is starting to grab hold of it, and it's the idea that exercise is medicine, but it's important to note that currently mental health professionals and medical doctors feel that exercise should be dealt with by somebody else. So almost this notion of Cartesian dualism, I'll treat the mind with whatever prescription drugs. Where back in 400 BC, we had somebody like Hippocrates who was, uh, he, he was prescribing exercise and activity for somebody with poor mental hygiene. So here's some examples of some really hot topics that are related to this notion. The Surgeon General's, the last Surgeon General's report had highlighted where we're at in the state of the, of the literature and made some comments that exercise may be associated with reductions in anxiety and depression and enhanced cognitive functioning. Now, let me highlight uh, something that I said there. Exercise may be associated. Those, that's not the strength of the language that we're looking for. I want very strong language that something, I want the Surgeon General to say exercise causes reductions in depression and anxiety and enhances cognitive function. And so what I study in my lab is this relationship, the relationship between exercise and stress. And at the same time, I've got colleagues in uh, psychology, maybe psychophysiology or neuroscience. They're studying the relationships between stress and anxiety, depression, cognition. Something like uh, for a soldier who's off in war and experiences battle, what's that person's risk of Alzheimer's disease later in life? And it's my hopes that we can el help elucidate these associations between exercise anxiety and these mental health states through the use of stress. And here's my doctoral advisor. I, I actually use this just so I can show his picture and make fun of him. No. Um, he says, we want to be able to someday say definitively that exercise causes a reduction in depression. Then we can go beyond simply saying, saying it is simply related or maybe related. It's the ability to say these things more concretely. And so how do I do this? What do we use in my lab? This is the paradigm. It can actually be quite fun or quite stressful, depending on which side of the research table you might be on. But we do stress people out, and we might assess uh, one's aerobic fitness, or you know, we, we might, I might use an acute exercise protocol or even a chronic exercise program. And then before and after, we uh, would have somebody sit, and we would give them various laboratory stressors. So it might be as, uh, what sounds as simple as mental arithmetic, although that can be quite stressful for, to somebody in the lab. Or we use public speeches or recall of stressful events. And then we look at what, are, what is the person's cardiovascular responses, biochemical responses. So we look at ACTH and cortisol responses. And as well, then uh, we use sort of some advanced te techniques to look at what might be driving any cardiovascular responses to stress. It's my hopes that what this will do is allow us to get at the mechanisms. Because currently, although we have this good news that exercise is associated with reductions in anxiety and depression and enhanced cognitive functioning. Uh, this is across all studies. There have been various meta-analytic reviews that have been uh, conducted. The relationship uh, in, in most of these meta-analytic reviews is small but statistically significant. What we're lacking is the role of mechanisms, and mechanisms allow us to go further in uh, being able to state, uh, or being able to approach causation. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah.
get home at about 5.30. I pick my daughter up from school, run to the gym, try to get some time in, go home. This is my day-to-day -day thing. I only do it because I know that there are some health risks in my family. But I wonder, how can people really exercise when there's such a push to work as much as possible? You have to work, excel, be the best, make money, and then slip in some time for exercise. It seems like a cool job. Yeah, yeah. And I like to think about that in terms of the, its relation to stress. There's debates over, you know, or is today's lifestyle more or less stressful than previous? And that can be debated. But uh, I do use pedometers to, uh, to assess physical activity. And uh, I also lecture on exercise. That's, that's part of what I do and conduct research in this area. It's disheartening to go home at the end of the day and open up your pedometer and notice that you might have 1,500 to 2,000 steps during the course of the day. And that's what I focus on. Uh, the, recommended value, the recommended number of steps for adults is 10,000, and here I'm sitting at 1,500 to 2,000. And what I do is start just shaking the pedometer. Makes, my, make, makes me feel better. But. There, there are some experts who contend that it could be the built environment, and that that, that would be one approach. We've, been, we've engineered activity out of today's lifestyle, and that we should go back to uh, what type of environments lend themselves to people being physically active so that they can get it in during the course of the day. Thank you very much. Ah, great, thanks.